Hey guys, video number three in our quest to briefly review the major topics of the year. Uh, let's see, so far we've done chapters three, four, five, and six. Last video was seven, eight, nine, ten. Chapter 11 deals with cell communication. So this one was kind of a, a quick one. Um, you know, again, there's different types of signaling that, that we talked about. There's autocrine, where a cell can actually release molecules to communicate with itself. Kind of weird. Uh, paracrine, where a cell can release molecules that just affect the cells around it. Endocrine, where hormones are released into the blood and they travel long distance to get to their target cell. Uh, but, but the basics of cell communication are the same. You've got a ligand, which is the molecule that fits into a receptor. So another lock and key interaction, just like enzyme and substrate, just like antibody antigen. Uh, here we have ligand and receptor. And this is where we can get our specificity from. So in other words, if I put a hormone into the blood, it doesn't affect every cell it comes in contact with. Um, those cells, let's say, are deaf to it because they don't have the proper receptor. If a cell is expressing the correct receptor, then it's able to bind that ligand and respond to it in some way. Um, so again, if we, if we talk about the three steps of cell communication, we've got reception, which is ligand and receptor, transduction of the signal, and that's sort of the domino effect happening inside the cell, the multiple steps involved in that transduction step, and then response, right? There's some final, either the cell starts doing something or stops doing something uh, as a response. So that's it in its, in its basics. Uh, remember that polar ligands need a cell surface receptor because they can't just cross the membrane by themselves. Nonpolar ligands like steroids for instance can go right across the outer cell membrane and typically they'll have an intracellular receptor and then they'll even go into the nucleus and directly affect the dna this is why a lot of steroidal drugs uh, are prescription because they are directly messing with your cell's dna it's a little dicier uh, a lot of the over-counter drugs work through cell surface receptors um, let's see. So receptor, ligand. Um, as far as the transduction steps, you might remember I showed you a lot of examples. Now you might see on the test, the AP test, uh, a diagram of a signaling pathway. I gave you a couple uh, sample FRQs like that. Basically, you can have G proteins, uh, which are involved in, in certain transduction pathways, tyrosine kinases, which are sort of receptor enzyme hybrids. Um, remember a kinase phosphorylates, adds phosphate to molecules that tends to activate them. Whereas a phosphatase is an enzyme that takes phosphates off of molecules and sort of deactivates them. So typically kinases will be phosphorylating and activating steps in the pathway. Um, until finally, like I said, you get some enzyme turned on or you get some gene to be expressed, you know, and that would, that would be the response of, of the whole process. The reason for so many steps in the transduction pathway, two things. It allows for amplification of the signal. So one ligand can create millions of activated molecules in the cytosol, potentially. Uh, and it also allows for fine-tuned control. So it's not a light switch. It's not on or off. It's, okay, we want the cell to do something, um, but, but just a little bit or a little bit more or a little bit less. And so all these different steps allow for multiple points of control. So, again, you can fine-tune your final response. Uh, mentioned in this chapter, too, was apoptosis which remember a cell can give, a certain type of cell can give a cell uh, the death touch and sort of trigger it to the target cell to break itself up into blebs. Remember like little little cytoplasmic compartments uh, and, and terminate itself. 
And so that is a type of communication that uh, typically is used for cells that are goobered up in some way. And we're going to talk about the cell cycle next. Remember, there's three checkpoints. If a cell uh, is identified as um, having something wrong with it, it can be triggered to go through apoptosis. So that was mentioned too in chapter 11. Chapter 12, cell cycle, IPMATC. Remember, IPMATC. Um, interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis. So let's see. Bacteria don't go through mitosis. Uh, remember, bacterial cells go through a process called binary fission, where their single circular chromosome is copied. Uh, the cell splits in half, boom, done, fast, simple binary fission. Eukaryotic cells go through the cell cycle, which involves mitosis. Now, IPMATC is the whole process. PMAT specifically is the mitosis part. Uh, during interphase, you've got G1, S, and G2. G1, the cell grows a little bit. Uh, S phase is real important. That's when all the chromosomes are copied, which we'll talk about how in a later chapter. Uh, G2, all your organelles are being copied. The cell grows a little more, uh, and that's interphase. Prophase, the cell prepares to divide. The DNA condenses into chromosomes. Uh, the spindle fibers form. The nucleolus disappears. Your nuclear membrane breaks down. Metaphase, all your chromosomes meet in the middle. Right? They look like X's now because they've been copied in S phase of interphase. So all in a human, 46 would line up along the middle. Anaphase, the chromatids get pulled apart by the spindle fibers. Uh, and then telophase, kind of everything that happened in prophase goes back to the way it was. Your nuclear membrane starts to reform. DNA loosens back up into chromatin. Uh, spindle fibers are going to break down. Nucleolus will reappear. And finally, cytokinesis. The cells split, become two separate daughter cells. Uh, in animal cells, there's a pinching of the membrane. It's called a cleavage furrow. And then the cells can separate. In plant cells, uh, they don't fully separate. They stay stuck together, but a new cell wall forms down the middle. And while that's under construction, it's called a cell plate that turns into a new cell wall. So that's kind of the gist of the, the process. Now, again, there's checkpoints. I think I gave you an FRQ that talked about cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases. Basically, these molecules are important. They, they help to uh, pass the checkpoints. If the, if the cyclins and the cyclin-dependent kinases are all uh, present and working correctly in the, in the correct concentrations, the cell passes the checkpoint. It's allowed to continue. Um, if for some reason something's messed up, well, that's when apoptosis happens and that cell is, is triggered to terminate itself. Cancer is a disease of the cell cycle. So remember that there are genes that control when a cell divides and when it stops dividing. So proto-oncogenes typically uh, produce molecules that stimulate cell division, growth factors and things like that. Well, if you mutate a proto-oncogene, it becomes an oncogene, and now the cell's continually getting the go signal. Tumor suppressor genes typically make products that stop the cell from dividing. Like, hey, you're good, thanks. Don't need you to divide anymore. Well, if you mutate a tumor suppressor gene, the cell never gets the stop signal. And so typically it's a combination of mutations. It's not just one or two. It could be anywhere from six to a dozen for that cell to become a cancer cell. So you need multiple mutations to accumulate, which is why cancers are more frequent in older people than younger people. Um, again, you might want to review some of your cancer terminology, benign versus malignant tumors, the spreading of cancer cells called metastasis, uh, which can then form metastatic tumors elsewhere from their origin. A lot of cool stuff uh, in cancer biology. So you know, maybe you want to take a peek at that. Chapter 13 is all about meiosis. 
which is similar to mitosis. In fact, it's IPMATC, PMATC. So there's two rounds of cell division. You start out with a diploid cell in meiosis, a germ cell, either in the testes or the ovaries. Diploid, just like the same cell you start with in mitosis. But it's a little bit different now. So you go through prophase one, already stuff starts to happen that's different. Um, your homologous chromosomes, the one from mom and the one from dad of the same type, get up next to each other. That's called synapsis. They cross over. They exchange corresponding segments. This creates genetic diversity. Metaphase one, the homologous partners meet in the middle. Not every chromosome, but the pairs meet in the middle. Anaphase one, the homologous pairs come apart. Telophase cytokinesis, you got two haploid daughter cells now, right? But the chromosomes are still two copies stuck together. So you did go through an interphase, remember, it was IPMATC, then PMATC. So during that first interphase, or the only interphase, you do copy your chromosomes. Meiosis 2 is all about separating the chromatids. So your two haploid cells go through a prophase 2 in... Uh, metaphase 2, all the chromosomes line up. Anaphase 2, uh, telophase 2, cytokinesis. Now you've got four daughter cells that are haploid, one of each chromosome, that are unique. Because of crossing over and be because of the way mom and dad's chromosomes are sorted, you've got four unique cells. In males, all four are spermatids, and they will mature into... Uh, functional sperm cells. They'll get rid of all their cytoplasm and organelles. They're basically just a nucleus with a flagellum. In females, three of the four cells sacrifice all their cytoplasm and organelles to the chosen ovum, the egg cell. The three cells that sacrifice are called polar bodies. They shrivel up, die, reabsorb what's left of them, which is really their nuclei with their chromosomes. Um, the, the, the egg cell is now the equivalent of four cells worth of cytoplasm with a haploid nucleus, and it becomes the female gamete. Um, just a comparison between mitosis and meiosis. In mitosis, start with a diploid cell, wind up with two identical diploid daughter cells that are identical. They're clones, if everything went right. Meiosis, you start, with, start out with a diploid cell, but you wind up with four haploid gametes that are all, all different, that are all unique. Um, mitosis, basically somatic body cells go through for growth and replacing old or damaged cells. Meiosis, it's all about making haploid gametes for sexual reproduction. All right, maybe the last one we'll look at in this video is chapter 14, good old Gregor Mendel, the pea plant guy. Um, Mendel did, as you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe over a million crosses with pea plants, um, came up with two laws of genetics that turned out to be true. Law of segregation, law of independent assortment. Um, Punnett squares show up in this chapter. So, you know, I guess start out with what Mendel did. He started with two purebred parental plants, let's say pure homozygous for purple flowers, homozygous for white flowers. He cross-pollinated them. His F1 generation, one of the two traits magically disappeared, right? The white flower color, gone. All the F1 babies were purple. We know they were all heterozygous and that purple, that purple allele was dominant, but Mendel didn't know that at the time. Then he took an F1, self-pollinated it, got his F2 babies, and this is the thing where 75% of them were purple, but 25% of them were white. We know they were homozygous recessive. Uh, and from doing this, these experiments in that same way, for flower color, for flower height, or excuse me, plant height, um, color of the seeds, the, the texture of the seeds, he came up with his laws of genetics. So, let's see if there's any more set up there. 
I'm actually going to cut away to I'm give this a shot. This whiteboard Chromebooks are so slow. Here we go. And so remember your genetics vocabulary, your terminology. Um, you know, if we do, let's see, we'll do, oh, this is going to be great. Big R, little R, stupid. crossed with another heterozygous plant. It's harder than it looks. <laughs> Well, remember the law of segregation. It says that the two alleles, right, one from mom, one from dad, that each parent has separate into different gametes, right? So these represent the eggs that mom can make. These represent the sperm cells that dad can make. And then you make babies in your Punnett square, right? So you have a homozygous red flower plant, heterozygous red, another heterozygous red, and a homozygous recessive. We'll say white flowers. This is a monohybrid cross. We're looking at one trait. Um, but it represents Mendel's first law of segregation, right? The two alleles that an organism, so this is mom and this is dad, well, mom's genes for flower color separated into different gametes. Dad's flower color genes separated into different sperm cells. That's the law of segregation. Don't do this. Uh, this is going to be a disaster. Me trying to show you dihybrid cross. But remember, we have a big R, little R, big T, little T. Maybe same thing. You know, two parents that are heterozygous for flower color and height. Well, this is the chant thing that you might remember. Oh, boy. So when we do our dihybrid cross, I'm not going to try to fill all these in, so don't even worry. Remember, our dihybrid cross is a 16-box Punnett square. Each gamete's going to have a flower color and a height gene. So to figure out what eggs mom can make, it's first and third, first and fourth, second and third, second and fourth. So mom can make this, oh boy, this egg. With this egg, with that combination, or this egg. Not sure why it's doing that. Or... This egg. So little r, big T, little r, little t. That's what that's supposed to say. So then you would combine your, do the same thing at the top. Combine your r's and your t's. You'd have big r, big r, big t, big t. Right? A baby that's homozygous for flower color and height. So on and so, so forth. When you cross two organisms that are heterozygous for both traits, you're going to get that 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. So in this case, you'd get nine red and talls, you'd get three red and short, you'd get three white and tall, and you'd get one white and short. So yeah, this whiteboard thing, maybe maybe not as easy to use as I was hoping it would be. Um, other terms, we have... Incomplete dominance, where if you're big R, little R, the alleles blend to make pink flowers. So there's a blending. And then there's co-dominance, where both alleles get expressed. Uh, when we talk about blood typing, if your blood type is AB, your heterozygous, you have an A gene and a B gene, both the A and B molecules get made on the surface of your red blood cells. They both win. So incomplete dominance is blending. Co-dominance, they both win. All right, the only other thing I'm seeing here is, well, this will come up, I believe, yeah, next chapter, next video. Um, when two genes are very, very close on the same chromosome, 
they can be linked. In other words, Mendel's law of independent assortment, which is kind of what the chant um, displays or illustrates. If genes are very, very close on the same chromosome, they actually can be linked and that would violate Mendel's second law, but that's the exception to it. Um, pedigrees, you might remember too, like, and I, again, I think this is more of a next chapter thing, but you could follow square males, right, circle females, who mates and makes what children. Um, so that's coming up next. And I think guys, probably we're going to talk about the gene linkage and, you know, sex linked diseases and traits. Um, DNA structure and DNA replication, gene expression and controlling gene expression, viruses, biotechnology, and that's kind of it. So after this video is done, which pretty much is, I'd say there's going to be two, maybe three more videos. And that'll be your crash course review of everything. Now, I did post some links to AP Bio review, um, you know, some online people, you know, it was it Bozeman does it and the other guy does worth looking at as well. Um, the College Board is posting these AP Bio review lectures, which I sent you the YouTube channel link. Uh, they're going to post every every so often uh, new ones as, as we go through this week and next week. Um, there's other links that I put in the classwork tab uh, for you to review. That, that one thing I asked everybody to set up an account for, um, you know, I'm still kind of myself going through seeing how we can use it. Um, I think it could be helpful. But, man, I have so many sample FRQ questions that I've found and, and created and looked up. And, uh, and since that's what the test is going to be, you know, I think we're going to go heavy there, but we still might use that, you know, sciencevideos.com or whatever it was uh, to help us prepare as well. Guys, the more I know it's hard to find motivation to do anything. Uh, we're going through May 15th, as you heard. Now, our test is Monday the 18th. So wouldn't it be a hell of a thing if Monday the 18th was our first day back and we had our AP bio test? That would be insane. Um, I know the governor's not thinking that way, but really we shouldn't, if, you know, I don't know. We, we should maybe go back after AP testing or, or before all AP testing, which we can't now. Because, but I'm, I'm rambling. Um, anyway, May 18th is coming. No motivation is hard to find. Keep at it, really. I mean, this is this is gonna this is gonna end, and you're gonna be in college, and and these credits are gonna help. And and let's not use this as an excuse to get lazy to let up. Um, this time of year, you know, you think after spring break it would have been after senior trip and all that we'd be cracking down hard man I'd, I'd be every day you know how i do right every day beginning a class you got to be studying you got to be we'd be having after school reviews and maybe i've done weekend stuff um and, and hey we could do that through this as well so your job is to is to review the old stuff and, and again softback review books however you want to do that online stuff practicing questions giving it your legit best shot because um, that's how you'll get better at interpreting and answering those types of questions. And then we do it, man. And then, then the day of the test, you give it your best shot. And I know you've learned a lot this year either way, but uh, I want you to get the reward for it, which is fours and fives on the AP test. So uh, I'll stop talking. I will see you in the next video. Everybody take care.